Welcome. Uh, today we're going to have a conversation about African American history in New York City. And to begin this story, we got to go all the way back. Uh, the first African American to reside in what would become New York City is a man named Jan Rodriguez. Uh, he uh, was the child of a Portuguese sailor and an African woman um, who was left by the Dutch in uh, what would become New York City. Uh, wasn't even New Amsterdam yet in 1613. The New Amsterdam colony wouldn't be established until 1624, but Jan was left there uh, to establish relations with the native populations um, in anticipation of a settlement eventually being founded, which it was about a decade later. Uh, the first slaves arrived in New Amsterdam in 1625, and, and they were really the first city builders. Uh, they widened what would become Broadway. Uh, they cleared the land of the Harlem forests. Uh, they built the wall that would become Wall Street. Still, uh, a portion of them eventually would uh, get their freedom. About 11 families would be freed and given land north of Wall Street, which eventually would actually be a wall as discussed. And, and the reason that, that they were given this semi-freedom, uh, they were still forced to pay an indemnity to the Dutch trading company uh, was because uh, the Dutch wanted to establish sort of a buffer zone between the native population and the Dutch community, which was at the very, very southern tip of the island. And so you have this establishment of the first emancipated free black population in North America. In Dutch New Amsterdam, slaves had limited rights in, in a way that they did not and would not in uh, British New York. Obviously, they were still subject to the horrors of slavery. However, they were sometimes allowed to earn wages. They were allowed to marry working class white women, uh, which did occur. Um, but a lot changed after the British took over in 1664. With the British conquest of what was then New Amsterdam and would become New York, um, the lives of enslaved people uh, drastically changed. There's often a myth uh, surrounding um, the British takeover that not much changed. Um, that really wasn't true if you were native or if you were African American. Um, for uh, blacks, they found new laws being established. Um, in 1711, a slave market was built by the British at the foot of Wall Street. Uh, in 1712, um, about 24 African Americans, uh, including some African American women, uh, they set fire to an outhouse in the middle of town. Uh, and when white folks came to put out the fire, they attacked them and killed them. Uh, they killed nine and wounded seven. Um, but obviously the white response was, um, extraordinarily violent. Uh, 21 uh, people of African descent were executed, many of them being burned alive. And as a result of that rebellion, no more than three African Americans could assemble. They made it illegal for people of African descent in the city to own property. In the 1740s, uh, another group of mysterious fires broke out and uh, kind of suspicions surrounding the African-American as well as the Irish Catholic community. Both of these groups were, were seen suspiciously uh, because these are the two groups that were extraordinarily persecuted in New York society. And blacks were just sort of arrested at will. Um, uh, one person came forward, an indentured servant named Mary Burton, and she uh, took claims a $100 reward um, and said there was a plot to overthrow the government uh, between freed blacks and slaves and, uh, and tied Irish Catholics to this conspiracy. Um, as racism went at this time, as racial fears went at this time, uh, white folks were really freaked out that um, black folks would rise up and try to overthrow them. And so uh, black New Yorkers were sort of rounded up and put on trial for their lives. Uh, 16 blacks ended up being hung as well as four whites. Um, 13 people of African descent were burned at the stake. Remember, New York City was a slave city. One sixth of the population was enslaved in the 1740s before independence. It was the second largest uh, slave city in the British North American Empire. 61% of white households in Kings County, which is Brooklyn, owned slaves in 1790, which was the largest percentage of the population in the North. Three-fifths of slaves coming to the United States would travel through the great port of New York. 
slavery remained essential in the city, even as they were establishing defenses to, to fight the revolutionary war, to achieve you know, the noble goals of freedom and liberty that we always talk about and are taught about in our textbooks. Um, it was slave labor that was being used to create defenses against the British. It, it is very fair to say that slavery was part of the justification for rebelling against the British by a lot of the white elite in the, what would become the United States. Um, in 1772 in Britain, uh, the Somerset case ruled that there is no place for slavery in British law. That was 1772. You'll remember the American Revolution really begins in 1775. Thousands of uh, it, formerly enslaved people fought with the British to earn their freedom because the British were seen as better on this issue. About 3,000 formerly enslaved Africans left with the British from New York City after the war was ended and the British had lost. Uh, the After the war, New York City became a center for free blacks. Uh, some of these were escaped blacks from the South, including those of George Washington, who himself was a notorious master who used to take the teeth of uh, his enslaved population to, to use as false teeth for himself um, because his teeth had rotted. Uh, in addition to the free black population, uh, there was a very large population of slaves after the Revolutionary War in New York City and the surrounding boroughs, which had yet to be incorporated into a single city. Um, it wouldn't be until 1827 that slavery would be outlawed in New York. That would make New York the second to last, New Jersey being the last northern state to outlaw the institution of slavery. And this was largely tied to accommodate the landowners in Kings County, which is Brooklyn. Even once slaves received emancipation in New York City, they still had trouble finding rights to vote. Uh, in 1821, a new law was made. Uh, previously, you had to own property in New York to, to vote. Um, after 1821, only black men had to own property and a prohibitive amount of property. Uh, women obviously could not vote until the passage of the 19th Amendment, and it was not until the 15th Amendment was passed in 1870 that black men fully got the right to vote in New York City. Even after emancipation in 1827, the blacks of New York City, they, they still struggled to, to achieve any semblance of equity. Um, the Five Points area, which is in Lower Manhattan, present-day Chinatown, uh, had a thriving black community. Uh, the first black Episcopal church was built there, um, but with the increase of Irish immigrants, they, they found themselves in conflict with uh, this new community to, to find low-income jobs, and oftentimes they were pitted against each other by the elites and the, and the bosses of New York. Uh, so that they could maintain a, a cheap labor force. And immigrants, uh, particularly the Irish immigrants, were, were very anxious about um, the abolition of slaves. Uh, they thought that a freed slave population or a freed formerly enslaved population coming to New York City uh, would compete with them for work and, and take their jobs. And um, instead of getting upset at sort of the, the structures of the economy, and, and there was some anger at the elites uh, for creating this this environment, but uh, a lot of their anger was directed towards the black community in New York. Um, and an anti-abolitionist riot, um, a, in other words, a pro-slavery riot, uh, took hold in 1834 when the Irish mobs went through the black neighborhood of Five Points, and, and they ended up burning the, the black Episcopal church um, in the Five Point area. Uh, this led to actually an exodus for much of the black community from uh, the Five Points in Lower Manhattan, further north to Seneca Village, which uh, was built in present-day Central Park, and we'll talk about in a minute. A and elsewhere, um, there were other communities developing for African Americans, including in Weeksville, Brooklyn, which uh, is present-day Ocean Hill, Crown Heights, and Bedford-Stuyvesant. The black community was continuously getting pushed up the island of Manhattan, right? First, they were um, denied the right to own property in the early community that was established during Dutch times near modern-day Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. Uh, then they were pushed out of five points by anti-abolitionist Irish mobs in the 1830s. 
And then in the 1850s, New York City's elite decided they wanted a massive park to, to correct for the mistakes of the grid plan. There wasn't enough fresh air in the city. Uh, we need to fix this. Um, the problem is, uh, in the area of Central Park, there were people living there. Uh, very famously, Seneca Village was there, which was a very wealthy black community relative to the rest of the black population in the United States. Their desires were ignored by the city. Uh, the village was burned to the ground. Those people were removed from Central Park. The park was made. Um, in the construction of the park, blacks were excluded from working. Uh, on the construction of the park because there was a fear that they would fight with uh, the Irish workers, so they were completely excluded from that project. Um, black people increasingly were seeing New York City uh, as not really a friendly place uh, for African American communities. And, and we have to remember this is still a time uh, where slavery exists in the 1850s. Uh, the Civil War had not yet been waged. And New York City was a very pro-Southern city. Um, there was a lot of financial ties between New York City and the South York City. So the, the financiers in New York City were, were really tied to the institution of slavery and ensuring that the South thrived. Uh, New York City Mayor Fernando Wood actually tried to break away from the North and join the South. Wood would send men to go and intimidate uh, abolitionists, either breaking up their meetings or interrupting and disrupting their speeches. Wood was an extreme racist, a white supremacist who regarded slavery as a divine institution, uh, thinking that whites were superior to blacks, and he certainly wasn't alone in the city in terms of feeling this way. So it's not surprising then that an editorial from the New York's Evening Post read, New York belongs as much to the South as to the North. Now, New York businessmen and merchants uh, were pretty dependent on the South to purchase New York goods. Um, supplying everything they needed to keep their plantation operation running. Fernando Wood called the South our best customer. Uh, she pays the best prices and pays promptly. Ships built by New York shipbuilders were fitted to hold slave cargo, uh, to hold human cargo. New York ships also were the transport vehicles for much of the South's cotton, taking them to mills in New England or across the ocean to England proper. Uh, about 59% of U.S. exports in the middle of the 1800s was from the cotton trade. So this was a huge enterprise, and New York was very much at the center uh, of distributing Southern cotton throughout the world. Of course, the, the cotton produced in the South was um, picked almost exclusively by slave labor. No city in the United States financed more slaving expeditions in the 19th century than New York City, even after the international slave trade was made illegal in the early 1800s. New York City was teeming with slave hunters who were searching for runaway slaves. This isn't to say that many New Yorkers, white abolitionists and black New Yorkers, wouldn't organize against this sort of activity. Uh, the Vigilance Committee was set up in the 1830s, and um, it was dedicated to first studying and then preventing the kidnapping of men, women, and children off the streets of New York. Now, um, there were thousands and thousands of freed blacks in New York City. Uh, there were also probably thousands of uh, people who had escaped slavery in New York City. And you had these slave catchers who would go throughout the city and, and oftentimes just pick up anybody. Um, whether they were an escaped slave or not, and um, attempt to return them to the South or take them to the South for the first time. Led by Connecticut-born David Ruggles, a freed black man, um, what the Vigilance Committee actually did was they publicized descriptions of captives, uh, they offered assistance to fugitives trying to get to Canada, and, and they often took action um, against slave-shipped captains uh, who were continuing the illegal practice of importing slaves. Uh, David Ruggle, he would write for The Liberator, which was published by William Lloyd Garrison. Um, he was a major player in uh, the mid-1800s abolitionist society in New York. He actually was pretty instrumental in terms of um, helping Frederick Douglass attain his freedom. David Ruggle and the Vigilance Committee, uh, they frustrated a lot of moderate white abolitionists who 
uh, wanted to end the institution of slavery, but also wanted to get rid of black people in the United States and send them back to Africa. Yet by the end of the Civil War, uh, their goal of creating a society in which uh, freed black people can live alongside uh, freed white people, um, that was seen as mainstream. And, and so they had a tremendous impact in terms of transforming the culture and, and the ideology surrounding slavery and, and uh, the future of black folks in the United States. New York City increasingly became an immigrant-dominated city where Irish and Germans found a place for themselves, later Jews and Italians as well, and Chinese taking up working-class positions in the city. Uh, but blacks were pushed out, and at this point, New York City is only the island of Manhattan. It's not till 1898 that the five boroughs become one city. And so because blacks are often excluded from employment opportunities, because they're harassed by um, poor immigrants and their lives are often taken and their homes are often burnt to the ground or threatened, um, they, they moved elsewhere. And Brooklyn in many ways became a safe haven uh, for the African-American community. That Brooklyn was a lot more friendly to the needs of freed black folks than uh, New York City. Um, as I talked about earlier, Weeksville, um, which is present-day Ocean Hill, Crown Heights, uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant. This was a pretty large community with about 500 homes at its height. It was home to black churches, black schools, a black benevolent association, a black elderly home, and had an orphanage by the 1860s. The land and the businesses were all black owned. Uh, it was known for employing blacks like as doctors, as professionals, as entrepreneurs. Um, in Weeksville, the creation of the Freedmen's Torchlight, one of the nation's first African-American newspapers, was published. Brooklyn was also home to Plymouth Church, which was founded by abolitionists in the 1840s. And the first reverend, Henry Ward Beecher, uh, was a very famous white abolitionist. Um, Plymouth Church would become known as the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad. Many formerly enslaved people escaping to freedom would hide at the church to avoid slave catchers as they made their way further north. Henry Ward Beecher was actually the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who authored Uncle Tom's Cabin, the anti-slavery novel that awoke the abolitionist consciousness of many northern whites. Uh, Plymouth Church would be visited by Abraham Lincoln before he gave his famous Cooper Union speech in 1860, uh, announcing his intention to run for the U.S. presidency on an abolitionist platform, particularly after 1850 with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, where... Um slave catchers could return you to the south even if you were in free territory in the north and, and so to to escape um, a, a, and secure your freedom meant going all the way to Canada. Um, Brooklyn became a, a, a central component to, to the Underground Railroad. In 1862, when Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address, he announced that all slaves, albeit in southern states, were then free. This sort of changed the perception of what the war was about for many Irish folks, who many of whom had just immigrated from Ireland, uh, didn't really understand why they were being asked to, to go fight for the abolition of enslaved peoples who would then come and compete with them for low-paying jobs in the city. They had been fighting to preserve the Union. The Battle of Gettysburg, which preceded Lincoln's address, cost the Irish community of New York many lives. In 1863, it was announced that hundreds of thousands would be drafted. Every white male under the age of 35 was eligible. Though many would serve bravely in the war, blacks were not citizens, and thus they were not eligible for the draft. Still a largely impoverished community, unlike wealthy New Yorkers, most of the Irish could not afford an exemption from service. The Irish saw themselves as fighting a war to free the slaves and damage their own job prospects in the process.
Further, they understood the war was extremely profitable for wealthy businesses in New York City who were receiving war contracts to supply the troops. While many of the rioters attempted to express their anger directly at the wealthy in New York City, African Americans of the city proved far easier targets. Estimates of the total debt range between 120 to 2,000. In addition to taking black lives, the, the mobs also attacked the black orphanage in New York City, burning it to the ground. And, and in, in the aftermath of this chaos, in the aftermath of this massacre, uh, much of the black community of New York decided it was time to leave. And um, some estimates have hundreds, some estimates uh, have over 10,000 blacks moving from New York City to Brooklyn. Um, which was seen as much friendlier and had uh, the established communities of Weeksville. And this isn't the end of the story of uh, New York City's African-American community during the Civil War. Uh, about 5,000 blacks for the Union from New York uh, were trained on Rikers Island. Um, they were initially not allowed to fight because whites wouldn't fight with them, but after the Gettysburg Address, they were included in the recruitment project. Uh, Frederick Douglass spoke at the Bridge Street Church in Brooklyn to launch an effort to recruit blacks to fight for the Union, and thousands did. The black troops from New York were organized into three separate units during the Civil War under the command of white officers, uh, the 20th, the 26th, and the 31st. Uh, the 31st was particularly notable because they were part of the advance line that ended up surrounding General Lee, who was the head of the Confederate Army, and prevented his army from escaping in Appomattox that forced his final surrender um, in 1865. While initially prevented from fighting, black troops ended up being you know, pretty instrumental to the Union victory over the Confederacy securing that slavery would be forever abolished from the United States with the passage of the 13th Amendment.